This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of violence or criminal activity in any way. Thomas Patera, known as Tommy Karate, was a mob hitman who struck fear not only in the community of Brooklyn, New York, but also among other mob hitmen because of his absolute brutality. As a member of the Bonanno crime family, Patera is suspected in as many as 60 murders and he might have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for one man. So who was this man and how did he bring Tommy Karate to justice? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching The Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we will take a look at the life and times of Tommy Patera and how he evolved from a skinny little kid that got pushed around to one of the most feared mob hitmen in history. We will talk about how he picked up the nickname Tommy Karate some of his endeavors with the mob, and how those earned him the nickname The Butcher. Then we will talk about his right-hand man, Frank Gangi, and how the deterioration of that relationship caused the whole thing to come crashing down. All in today's episode. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, you got a question, put it in the comment sections below. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so now. Thomas Patera, born December 2nd of 1954, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. The son of Joseph and Catherine Patera, Tommy attended school in the Gravesend neighborhood of Southern Brooklyn. Of relevance was that he was picked on and bullied by his peers due to his high-pitched voice. Students on the baseball team were particularly cruel, which led Tommy to break into the school, stealing the baseball team's equipment, which he then sold on the streets. But the act of revenge was short-lived as he was soon arrested for burglary. Fortunately, he was still a juvenile, so he escaped serious consequence. But the bullying prompted a response in Tommy. He started working out, he joined a karate dojo in town, and he quickly rose to the top of his class. He had a daily regimen that involved lifting weights, studying Keokushin fighting strategies, and watching kung fu films. For those unfamiliar with martial arts, Keokushin is a style of karate originating in Japan that is full contact, hard training karate. This ain't just for exercise, this is the real deal karate. And for those of you unfamiliar with kung fu films, Patera was a huge fan of Bruce Lee through shows like The Green Hornet and the 1969 movie Marlowe. Anyway, after winning a major karate competition in Brooklyn, Patera spent 27 months in Tokyo, Japan, training under revered Japanese martial arts instructors. He was also trained to use various weapons, including nunchucks and katanas, which are Japanese swords. While in Japan, he ate mostly fish, rice, and edible seaweed. He read books about war and fighting. He grew his hair down to his shoulders to adopt a Bruce Lee-style image, and he worked in a chopsticks factory to earn money. His mother and aunt went over to visit him and were impressed with the change in his physical appearance. And it was really a complete transformation from a kid who was bullied into a man that truly thought of himself as invincible. All of this ultimately led to the nickname Tommy Karate by friends and fellow mobsters. So after a couple of years in Japan, Tommy returned to Brooklyn. His friends back in Brooklyn, they didn't work out, they drank. 
So Tommy found himself in a lot of bars. And while he had originally planned to open a dojo, those plans changed after he crossed paths with several mob figures who owned and frequented these bars. And it was through these associations that he got involved in organized crime. So it's 1980, and he started doing jobs for the Bonanno crime family. Specifically, Anthony Indelicato Bruno, probably best known for shooting the cigar-chomping Carmine Galanti, was a mob hitman who took Patera under his wing and schooled him in the ways of Casa Nostra, a.k.a. the Sicilian mob. However, Bruno's days were numbered. He belonged to a faction headed by a group of capos who opposed the Bonanno family's leadership under Philip Rusty Rastelli. This defiance ultimately led to the faction's leadership, which included Bruno's father, Sonny, being summoned to a meeting and murdered in a club. After the hit, Bruno and Tommy Karate fled Brooklyn and hid out in Long Island until they could broker a deal to peacefully rejoin the Bonanno crime family. From there, Patera was assigned to work for an Anthony Spiro, whose crew was involved in extortion, loan sharking, drug dealing, which often took the form of robbing street drug dealers and reselling their product. This was a particularly profitable way to do business because when you rob a drug dealer, you get their stash of drugs to sell, their stash of cash, which was usually substantial, and often you get their customer base because junkies really don't care who they get their product from. And in the end, what are they going to do about it? Call the cops and report that Pateras stole their cocaine stash and their drug money? Yeah, Probably not. One of his most notable acts occurred on August 29th of 1988 when Patera allegedly ambushed and murdered Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson as he walked ahead to their car. Johnson had been a longtime associate and driver for the Gambino family boss, John Gotti. The hit was reportedly delegated to Patera after Gotti discovered that Johnson was a government informant. On another notable occasion, two of Patera's associates allegedly murdered a couple of Colombian drug dealers and stole 16 kilograms of cocaine. As the story goes, the killers intended to drive the Colombian's car to Staten Island to bury the bodies, but as they could not drive a stick shift, they had to leave the car with the bodies inside the trunk in a Brooklyn parking garage. Patera was not thrilled with that result, but then he got really mad when he learned that they had used one of his guns in the murder and just threw it in the harbor to get rid of it. Silly mobsters. Willing to do whatever was asked of him during the 80s, Patera became a made man or a fully initiated member of the Bonanno crime family. And he was feared even by gangsters and other hitmen because he was particularly brutal. He didn't just kill his victims. His M.O. was to drag their bodies into a bathtub where he would dismember them. He would then place the various parts into garbage bags, those bags into suitcases, and those suitcases would be buried in different locations within a secret mob graveyard about 30 minutes away in Staten Island near the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. They selected the location because they believed the damp soil would accelerate decomposition and the wildlife refuge, which was federally protected land, would ensure that the bodies would not be unearthed during, say, a future construction project. Patera's mistake would be that he enjoyed keeping souvenirs and other jewelry from his victims to remind him of his work. They made pretty damning exhibits at his trial, but that would be for later. For now, he was known as Tommy Karate, a.k.a. The Butcher. So it's time to introduce you to Frank Ganji. Originally, he was a drug dealer who developed a really good weed distribution business in Brooklyn with a Billy Bright and a Arthur Guvenaro. Well, Guvenaro got caught stealing from the Enterprise, so Ganji and Bright lured him to a stash house on April 27th of 1985 and filled him full of bullets. 
Before he died, Gubinaro would smash through a window, stumble down the street, and tell a cop at the street corner who had done that to him. So, Ganji was charged with murder, but after convincing a jury, he acted in self-defense and serving a sentence for a year on a lesser offense, he was back out on the streets with his weed distribution business now under the supervision of one Thomas Karate Patera. However, Ganji's bad acts of yore had not been forgotten. Louis Bop Guvenaro, brother to the murdered Arthur, had put out a hit for both Billy Bright and Ganji. Now, this conflict was considered an internal matter within the Bonanno crime family. So Patera would set up a meeting in the Sicilian tradition that they used to resolve internal conflicts without violence. So the group all met at a restaurant. They shook hands and they made their pitch. Bop demanded blood, but Ganji had Tommy Karate in his corner. Anthony Spiro would be the arbiter, and after hearing of Tony's drug abuse and theft, he declared the matter over. Bop wasn't happy about it, but there wasn't anything he could do. As for Ganji, Patera had just saved his life. So Tommy Karate basically owned him at that point. So it was also during this time that Tommy had married and divorced and then found the love of his life in Celeste Le Perry. Tommy was described as a different man when he was around her. He was kind, he was polite, he was funny. Anyway, they spent a lot of time with Frank Gangy and his girlfriend slash lover, Phyllis Birdie. Naturally, Celeste and Phyllis became fast friends, and all was really well except for one thing. Celeste had a pretty bad drug habit. So in order to attempt to circumvent this habit, Tommy got word out that he would kill any drug dealer in town that provided her with drugs. And it worked, except that Phyllis liked partying with Celeste, so she continued to supply her with drugs. After a couple of more incidents, Tommy would forbid them from seeing one another. But defiantly, they just continued to get together, secretly hiding their drug abuse. That was until September 10th of 1987, when Tommy got that fateful call. Celeste had overdosed on a cocktail of heroin and cocaine, commonly referred to as a speedball. By the time he got to Phyllis's apartment, law enforcement was already there. Ganji would state that when Tommy saw Celeste's lifeless body, he broke down crying uncontrollably. A few moments later, Phyllis walked into the room, sending Tommy into a rage. He screamed, I told you to stay the fuck away from her, and he slapped her across the face. He kept repeating, I am going to get you, as a couple of officers on the scene drug him from the apartment. By the end of the day, he had ordered Frank Ganji to kill Phyllis Birdie. Well, that was his girlfriend, his lover, so of course Frank didn't want to kill her. So Frank tells her to get out of Brooklyn and go into hiding, which she did. And from there, Ganji would continue to see her secretly but he would report back to Tommy that he didn't know where she was. A dangerous game indeed, which came to an end on a fateful afternoon. Ganji was actually partying with Phyllis when he got a call from Tommy. Sensing that Tommy already knew where he was and who he was with, he whispered, I found Phyllis. She's here with me. Well, it turns out Tommy didn't know where he was or who he was with, but the cat was out of the bag now. So Tommy got the address, ordered Ganji to keep her there, and he headed over. Patera would burst into the flat, march into the bedroom, and shoot Phyllis in the head multiple times. From there, he had Ganji drag her into the bathtub where the butcher went to work on her body. Poor Ganji. Not only had he unnecessarily ratted out his lover, but then he had to watch her murder, gruesome bathtub scene, and then burial at the wildlife preserve. A bad day indeed. So this was the first horrible event for Frank Ganji. Event number two happened when Patera ordered Ganji to kill one of his best friends and mentors, Andy Jakakis. 
and it was over a conversation where Jakakis had disrespected Tommy Karate. So now it's mid-June of 1988, and Ganji again has no choice but to kill his friend. So he and an accomplice, Toby Profeto, get into a car. Ganji's behind the wheel. Jakakis is riding shotgun with Profeto directly behind him. And they drove through the streets of Brooklyn. As they drove, Ganji cranks up the music. Start Me Up by the Rolling Stones blared over the speakers when bang! A deafening blast roared from inside the car. As Ganji's ears ringing regained his bearings, Jakakis slumps forward, dead. From there, racked with guilt over his involvement in the death of his girl and his friend, Frank Ganji sank into a deep depression and submerged himself in booze and drugs until one night when he was out driving on a drunken bender, he was stopped by law enforcement. And he started talking and talking and He didn't stop. He told them everything about what he had done by the side and under the control and order of Tommy Karate Patera. Armed with that information, FBI agents would raid Patera's apartment in southern Brooklyn and discover more than 60 automatic weapons, knives, swords, and literature such as the Hitman's Handbook and Kill or Be Killed, which dealt primarily with assassination techniques. Investigators would also eventually find six of Patera's victims in the mob graveyard in Staten Island in the Wildlife Refuge. On June 4th of 1990, Patera was indicted for heading a drug dealing crew and for his involvement in seven murders. Investigators believed that Patera had been involved in as many as 60 murders, but there were seven that they thought that they could prove. It was also alleged that Patera's crew sold hundreds of pounds of cocaine, heroin, and marijuana. So the prosecution's main witness was, of course, Frank Ganji, and he detailed numerous violent murders he witnessed or was involved in through Tommy, including the murder of Phyllis Birdie. On June 25th of 1992, Patera was convicted of murdering six people and supervising a massive drug distribution operation in Brooklyn. Interestingly, Patera would be acquitted in the 1988 murder of Willie Johnson, Gotti's former driver. At trial, the chief prosecutor, David Shapiro, demanded the death sentence for, quote, heinous, cruel, and depraved, end quote, murders that were committed by Patera. He called Patera a heartless and ruthless killer, explaining in detail how Patera had tortured one victim slowly by deliberately shooting him seven times in various parts of his body. The prosecution also produced agents who testified to digging up graves containing the dismembered bodies of some of Patera's victims. Patera's defense lawyer, David Runke, urged the jury to reject the death penalty on grounds that Patera had no prior criminal record and that other participants in the murders were allowed to plead to a lesser charge. Ultimately, the jury found Tommy Karate guilty for six murders, among other crimes, but rejected the death penalty for Patera. After the verdict was read, Patera smiled and gave a thumbs up to reporters sitting in the Brooklyn courtroom. He would live. At sentencing in October of 1992, alluding to evidence that Patera brutally killed his victims and dismembered their bodies, the judge said, Mr. Patera, nobody deserves to die as these people died, and then sentenced him to six consecutive life sentences, which Patera is now serving out at a United States penitentiary in Kentucky. As for Frank Ganji, he would be sentenced to 10 years in exchange for his testimony against Tommy Karate Patera. And today, Frank Ganji is a free man. So that's the episode. That's the story of Tommy Karate. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button for me. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Subscribe now. That's all I have for you today. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. <laughs>